Right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Gravita webinar. Um, the title of this morning's webinar is HMRC Tax Investigations and Dispute Resolution. Um, I'm Tim Palmer, and I'm going to be hosting the event this morning. This is a day off for me, actually, because normally I do all the lecturing and everything, but um, uh, it's I'm hosting the event uh, today. A uh, bit very briefly, my role, um, I'm a tax consultant within Gravita, which um, to be honest, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be. I think Gravita is a buzzing, um, exciting firm, and uh, I really enjoy my role as a consultant. But away from that, I lecture all over the UK on various tax matters as well. But as I say, um, this is a day off for me, and I'm going to introduce my colleague Dion Laycock, who will be presenting this tax investigations uh, webinar. A bit about Dion very briefly. Um, I think he's very worried about what I'm going to say at the moment, but um, um, I'll stick to um, the official stuff. Um, Dion is a partner at Gravita and he leads the tax investigations team. He's also a justice of the peace and he regularly sits in the magistrates court and the crown court. That's the good things. The bad things is that he's an Arsenal fan. So um, that's I don't really want to talk about that at all. Um, but being serious for a minute, right, I'm going to be really serious now. I've recommended Dion to many accountants over the last few years. This is the serious stuff. And um, some of the, the accountants' clients have had big tax problems, as Dion will tell you. And they come to me quite disturbed, quite upset. And But I always know that when I recommend Dion to these accountants and to anyone, they're in a very safe uh, place with a safe pair of hands and the feedback that I've had from when Dion's been handling these investigations is incredible. Um, they're very pleased with the way he's handled the investigation and also the outcome and the results that he's achieved. And I understand this morning that several accountants who Dion's helped are watching this webinar and they will, I'm sure, uh, endorse what I've just said. Um, Dion is going to be speaking this morning on various areas, including the range of work of a tax investigator, um, sorry, the tax specialist, uh, assessments, time limits, schedule 36, deliberate behaviour and lots of other topics as well. Just a few couple of final things before I hand over to Dion. Um, the admin, the talk's going to last about an hour approximately. There's a lot to cover. So if you have a question this morning, I think it'd be better if you email Dion the question and he will deal with it after the webinar. Dion will give you all his contact details. So if you've got a question, email um, Dion and he'll deal with it after the webinar. I work closely with Dion. Uh, Dion and I have got a, an article in the National Taxation magazine called Taxation and that comes up in a couple of weeks time and uh, you should look out for that. Um, final other thing, there's feedback forms at the end. If you could complete those and send them in to us, we'd be very grateful. Right, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Dion. Over to you, Dion. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Gravita um, Tax Investigations and Dispute Resolution uh, webinar. Um, it's a nice introduction from Tim. Um, let me tell you a bit about Gravita. He told you a little bit about me. Um, Gravita, um, we're a top of 30 accounting firm at the moment. We've got about 400 team members um, and we're a full service uh, accountancy firm. Uh, we've got a global reach. We're a member of DFK International, which is uh, the sixth largest worldwide association of independent accounting firms. So we really do have a worldwide reach um, and we live by our values. Um, and we genuinely mean that. We, our values are all that we're ambitious, we value relationships, we get things done, we communicate clearly and we care deeply. And we really do um, hold each other to those uh, values. Uh, the, the most junior member of the team can hold the most senior members of the team accountable to those values. And we encourage that. So we, we really are that uh, sort of firm where everyone has a part to play. Uh, and that uh, feeds through to the clients as well, where um, when we undertake a client, uh, work that we, we put a team together where we can work together um, in the best interests of the client. Um, Tim told you a little bit about me, um, uh, uh, and I can quickly uh, tell you that I've been in practice for just over 26 years. Um, I've been 
27th year in November. Um, I'm a partner at Gravita. Um, I actually read law at university and then did what was the solicitor's finals, which was then called the legal practice course, went immediately into accounting, did the chartered tax exams, fellow of ATT and a full member of STEP. Uh, my expertise um, really is complex tax investigations, COP8 um, and COP9. Um, we'll talk very briefly about those in the moment. Uh, mediation and the tax tribunal also are on a private client uh, advisory uh, service uh, and deal with all levels of compliance as well. So um, do get in contact if I can help with any of those. But today's all about tax investigations. Um, and what does a tax investigation specialist cover? Well, there are many things we cover, uh, more than you would imagine, but I probably the thought. There are the investigations and inquiries, of course. Um, so that's a sort of uh, Section 9A personal self-assessment inquiries, the uh, company inquiries. But also there are sort of national minimum wage inquiries that we can uh, deal with, um, VAT and best judgment assessments, Regulation 80, sort of pay as you earn um, determinations, uh, national insurance decisions, uh, sometimes called Section 8 decisions. Um, status inquiries as well, is someone an employee, someone self-employed? Um, that's sort of hot topic at the moment. Uh, it leads into personal service companies and IR35. Um, there are quite a few managed service companies uh, inquiries at the moment. Um, and we've got uh, uh, a few of those cases where uh, managed service companies are being looked at by HMRC. Uh, there are a few cases or lead cases that are going to the tribunal at the moment. Um, and many cases are stayed behind those at the moment. Um, and HMRC are worried that the, those cases that are stayed behind the lead cases at the tribunal will fall out of uh, uh, assessment time limits for national insurance. So if you've got managed service companies uh, or you, you or your clients have, um, you're likely to hear from HMRC with some uh, standstill agreements. Um, standstill agreements are a deed where you agree to stay all of the um, time limits uh, in litigation. Um, more than happy to help with any of those that you've got. Uh, as I say, we've got a few of those uh, at the moment. Um, Schedule 36 information notices we deal with as well. Um, uh, and we'll come on to those and talk about those in more detail uh, in a moment. Uh, counter avoidance and fraud investigation service, uh, investigation service code of practice eight, where the fraud investigation service, which is HMRC's elite investigation um, division, they look at uh, marketed schemes or structured tax avoidance. Uh, and then code of practice nine, which is where there's um, suspected tax fraud. I, I could do a whole session on Code of Practice 9. Um, some of you that get that the, the Society of Trust and the State Practitioners Journal, STEP Journal, may have seen my recent article with Bear Cop, where I discussed the changes in um, Code of Practice 9 and, and how that came about. But very briefly, um, a lady called Zoe Gascoigne now leads up the Fraud Investigation Service and has um, jurisdiction over Code of Practice 9. Um, and she came from the Crown Prosecution Service, um, so she was a she was a prosecutor. That was that's what her background is, and that's what she does. Um, and she came into the revenue, took over um, fears, and didn't know that COP nine was there. So it was a surprise to someone who's a criminal prosecutor that a civil way out of a, a, a admitted deliberate tax irregularity um, was offered by HMRC. Um, so she was responsible for sort of revising. Well, not revising, but restating the terms of the Code of Practice 9. And that generally meant that she wanted to restate that Code of Practice 9 is a direct alternative to uh, criminal prosecution. Uh, it restated the terms of COP9 to say, well, look, this is what we expect from you um, if you go into COP9 or we allow you into COP9. And these are the consequences of non-compliance. And it places a real emphasis on Code of Practice 9 as a direct alternative to uh, criminal prosecution. Um, it also uh, widened COP9 a little bit to say, well, there are fraud related to non-HMRC areas like COVID grants and other targets of financial support, which can also now go into COP9 as well. So, as I say, you could spend a whole day talking about COP9, but uh, we deal with them uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and you, I think you really do need specialist help with the code of practice. Um, other than that, we also assist in criminal prosecutions as well. So, um, we're someone is being criminally prosecuted, there are, of course, uh, 
and refer them to solicitors that have to act for them in the criminal matter. But we stay involved, um, do all the background work and forensic analysis uh, for that as well. Uh, moving on uh, from investigations and inquiries, uh, voluntary disclosures. Um, uh, the article that Tim referred to, uh, we're, we're going to sort of mention this in more detail, but how HMRC get their uh, information um, is incredible. They have a very wide database of information, their Connect software, the common reporting standard, um, where exchanges of information occur uh, between tax agencies around the world, um, lead to nudge letters. Um, when you get this nudge letter, you'll often have a certificate, a certificate of tax position that you're invited to sign and send back. It's very rarely, if ever, appropriate to send that certificate back. Um, we're happy to chat on, on what you should do. You should respond to a nudge letter because it means that HMRC have got heightened interest in you as the taxpayer, your client. So there should be a response. Um, but that invariably, that won't be sending that certificate back. Um, so disclosures, choosing the right disclosure facility as well, you know, whether it's the worldwide disclosure facility, the Let Property Campaign, or um, if there's uh, admitted deliberate uh, errors um, or inaccuracies, um, you need to consider Code of Practice 9, because Code of Practice 9 is the one that gives you um, immunity from prosecution. So all of that as well, very, very important to choose the right disclosure uh, facility. Um, you don't want to have you or your clients admit deliberate behaviour and go into the worldwide disclosure facility because you'll effectively hand HMRC a prosecution on the plate. So really important decisions to be made about uh, voluntary disclosures and the right route. Um, we also get involved with uh, tax payments and time to pay arrangements um, where HMRC are pursuing you or your clients for um, amounts of money. Uh, and that starts with looking at the assessments. Are, are what they're asking for, um, is, is that correct? Is it at the right amount? Um, can we challenge that? Can we have an appeal? Can we ask for a related? If HMRC say no, can we ask the tax tribunal to, for permission to appeal late? Um, and that's all part of that tax payments bid. Um, if we agree that the amounts being pursued uh, are correct, then we can ask for a time to pay in range. Um, where it goes beyond that, or, and, and we end up with the Enforcement and Solvency Office, which sometimes can be a difficult office to deal with, um, but their role is enforcement and insolvency. Um, so they deal with winding up petitions, um, bankruptcy petitions, all matters of insolvency. So um, we often you can negotiate a time to pay an arrangement with the Enforcement and Solvency Office, even though they are the last step before um, the High Court proceedings. Uh, and, and, and you can agree a time to pay arrangement with them that you can have the backing of a consent order. It's called a Tomlin order, um, and it affects the time to pay arrangement effectively becomes um, a, a, an order of the court. So we can deal with all of that uh, as well. Uh, mediation. Um, when ADR first came in uh, to being, um, I was hesitant in using it. I was very much a tribunal person that uh, areas of dispute should be dealt with in the tax tribunal. Um, I, I've actually changed my mind completely. I think ADR is a, it's a brilliant facility. Um, HMRC are encouraged to use it. And very often it helps to have an officer in the room with you or your client to say, well, here, here's what they, they are saying. What makes you disbelieve? Uh, and having someone in a room um, with you or your clients, it makes it difficult for them to say, well, I don't believe you. So, well, why not? Here they are. You, you can talk to them. So um, we've had some very good results on uh, mediation. Um, and I, I really think it works. Um, HMRC say it has a success rate of about 78% against a target of 75%. Um, and I, from what I've seen in my experience of ADR, I, I, that's probably an accurate figure. Um, it, it seems about a right level uh, of success for me. Not every case will be um, agreed, but even if you've got a tax tribunal case, ADR is very good at narrowing the issues um, to ask the tribunal to rule. So I'm a huge fan of ADR, uh, and I think it puts real pressure on the decision-making officer um, to account for what they've done. Um, you know, a keyboard warrior is one thing where you can say what you like in a letter or an email, but to have a person in the room, um, well, virtual room now, they're, they're not done face to face so much now, um, it's usually online, but nevertheless, it's good to um, to have a face there and, and a live chat. Um, and of course, that leads on to the tax tribunal. We deal with all matters of the tax tribunal. Um, 
on matters of pure tax law, uh, we'll take ourselves where there's an element of cross-examining witnesses, we'll instruct counsel um, uh, to do that. So uh, we're well versed and we have some tax tribunal cases um, going at the moment. Um, and we're very happy to take them. And I think it's the tax tribunal is a useful tool um, just to let the HMRC officer know that we will go to the tax tribunal and ask for a judge's ruling if if we're not in agreement. Um, and that sometimes can, can help uh, move things along without resorting to the tribunal. Also, a tax investigation specialist looks at complaints against officers um, where an officer has acted unreasonably or um, um, but it's usually unreasonably. Um, we can make an initial complaint, and if that's not satisfactory, you can always move on to um, a tier two complaint. So quite a wide scope. We can help with most things. Um, we can also provide a risk analysis uh, service as well. Um, so uh, if you're thinking of entering into transactions and you want to know the risks, we, we sort of do that as well. But that's not the focus of, of today. So let's get into the, some sort of substantive areas that we're going to look at today. And the first one is the assessment time limits. Um, incredibly important to know how far HMRC can go back um, because uh, many of you would have experienced, I'm sure, that you get, a, a, for example, a Section 9A inquiry notice into someone's tax return for 21-22. And then in, in the uh, request for information though so you disposed of the property in 2017 we have details of that as well but of course that's not right the section 9a inquiry um, doesn't allow them to look back like that um, they would have to rely on the discovery provisions and the discovery positions um, put the onus the, the first hurdle is an HMRC to show that they've made a discovery so um, we we all know from experience that HMRC officers whether deliberately or naively, will stray outside of the legal framework of the inquiries, and that includes the assessment time limits. Um, so let's quickly look at the assessment time limits. Um, reasonable care, where you've taken reasonable care, uh, but an error has still occurred, the assessment time limit is four years. So HMRC can still go back four years, um, even when you've taken reasonable care, um, but they can't go back any further than four years. And reasonable care is for the taxpayer to prove. So where we say, no, actually, this, uh, this error with inaccuracy has come about because even though we took reasonable care, it's for us to show how we took reasonable care, and it's for us to prove that. Um, carelessness is for HMRC to prove because they are alleging that we were careless. So that's the burden of proof rests with them. Um, and where they can show that you or your client has acted carelessly, then they can go back six years. Um, where there is deliberate behaviour, um, an HMRC have to prove deliberate behaviour, um, they can go back 20 years. Um, and that's the same way if there's a failure to notify. If, no, if HMRC haven't been notified of a source of income or capital gains, then they can go back 20 years as well. But the one I haven't mentioned at the moment is for offshore matters. Uh, and that is a 12-year uh, window. And that's not behavior driven. So that doesn't matter. That's 12 years, irrespective of whether you took reasonable care or you were careless, um, because it was deliberate, it goes back 20 years. So that offshore is reasonable care and uh, uh, carelessness. They can go back 12 years where there's an offshore um, element to it. So there's no proof um, required for that one. Um, that simply is a 12 year window. Um, VAT are slightly different. VAT assessment time limits tend to be four years uh, and 20 years. Um, there's no in between. Um, there are some additional complexities to VAT assessment time limits, uh, and that's they generally must be raised within two years of the relevant period or within 12 months after evidence of sufficient, that is sufficient in the opinion of the commissioners to justify the making of the assessment comes to HMRC's knowledge. Um, and there was a recent case on that DCM optical holdings limited at the Supreme Court. So, uh, there are different time limits uh, for VAT, um, different elements, but generally for the direct taxes, the assessment time limits are four, six, twelve, and twenty years. Uh, and don't be afraid to hold an officer to account um, about assessment time limits, um, and don't be afraid to challenge uh, uh, an officer where they have asked for something in a, for example, that Section Nine A uh, personal self-assessment inquiry notice where they've asked for something outside of that window. 
Section 9A for very specific to that tax return. It doesn't allow for them to go back um, beyond that year. Um, so do ask uh, and do challenge HMRC officers uh, where you think the assessment time limits have been breached. Um, those assessment time limits are set in statute. That Parliament has decided that's what the assessment time limits are. And it's not obstructive or unreasonable to say to an officer, actually, I don't think your request is within the legal framework. Um, you know, that, that can't be considered as non-cooperation because all it is is clarifying the, the law. Uh, we haven't written the law as practitioners. Uh, parliamentarians have written the law, uh, and that's what we all have to abide by. That's the only thing we have. So uh, if an officer says, you know, it, it will go towards penalties if you don't cooperate, um, I would challenge that and say it, it isn't uh, lack of cooperation. It's clarifying the legal framework. Um, so do do keep in mind assessment time limits. They are incredibly important. Um, at, you know, and they should be at the forefront of your thinking when you're dealing with requirements. Uh, I want to move on to Schedule 36 notices because uh, these are prevalent um, and sometimes misused by um, officers. Um, they were introduced by the Finance Act in 2008 when I think it was Alistair Darling was the Chancellor. Brown was the Prime Minister at that point. Um, and there are certain powers for certain taxes that took um, took effect at different times. So uh, initially, uh, the Schedule 36 uh, powers came into effect on the 1st of April 2009. Uh, and it took effect for income tax, capital gains tax, corporation tax, VAT, um, and employers' obligations to account for pay as you earn national insurance and deductions under the construction industry scheme. Um, and then a year later, from the 1st of April 2010, it was extended to insurance, premium tax, inheritance tax, SDRT, SDLT and SDRT, uh, petroleum revenue tax, aggregates levy, landfill tax, climate change levy. It then rolled out further. Um, so, for example, from the 1st of April 2013, it uh, included ATED as well. So it covers pretty much all taxes that you'll ever uh, come into contact with. Um, and uh, it, it, they are used regularly by uh, officers, uh, and sometimes they're used uh, not in a law completely lawful way. So let, let's have a look at what, what it is. Paragraph run right at the beginning of that um, legislation says, an officer of HMRC may, by notice, in writing, require a taxpayer, A, to provide information, or B, to produce a document, if the information or document is reasonably required by the officer for checking the purposes uh, by the officer for the purpose of checking the taxpayer's position, those two words "reasonably required" are hugely important, um, and they are hugely important because um, the the onus is on the officer to show why they are reasonably required. Um, you can't ask for information that goes outside uh, of a of what's required. So. Uh, there are many, many cases of a tax tribunal on this point. Um, one such case is Euro and another. Uh, it's a 2022 case um, where the taxpayers were a married couple, both UK residents that had shares in a UK company. Uh, the husband transferred his shares uh, to his father, who was resident in Cyprus. Um, guess what? The father then received the dividends from the company um, and that's disregarded income from a non-resident in the UK, so they weren't taxable in the UK for that non-resident. But he loaned the money back to um, his son, his wife, uh, the son's wife, uh, to pay the school fees for their children. So a pretty obvious um, transfer of assets aboard track. Uh, HMRC had already concluded that there was a transfer of assets uh, issue here, and they raised discovery assessments um, to recover the tax on that. But then they also issued an information notice asking for information way beyond what they already had. Um, uh, and the tax tribunal said, well, you'd already made your discovery assessments. No more information. Was re it wasn't reasonably required to have more information. So, you know, you, you, the case was closed in effect. So the information wasn't reasonably required. So the penalties for non-compliance all fall away because it wasn't a valid notice. Uh, it didn't fit paragraph one. Um, in another case, Matthew Jenner, uh, HMRC 
issued information notices um, and they were, they were asking about household expenses, personal expenditure, directors' loan accounts, any trusts or any partnerships he was a, a member of, or beneficiary of, or settler of, or the trusts, and all financial, uh, personal financial information uh, accounts and statements. Um, but that they didn't suspect anything. They just asked for all of that, um, looking um, looking for something. And the tribunal said, no, that's not right. You can't do that. You can't use uh, an information which is for a fishing expedition. You can't go, you, it has to be reasonably required because there is an issue that you think has, has arisen. You, you can't use them to go uh, get information to look for something. So. They were the, the sort of the fishing expedition cases that said you, you can't use an information notice uh, for a fishing expedition. And so it's okay to say to an officer, you know, to put them to proof and say, why is it reasonably required? You know, what, what is it that makes you want this information? What is it that you're checking? Uh, we had a case in Graviton. Um, a, a company was uh, going for a page of earn inquiry uh, and they were dealing with it themselves. Uh, and some um, but then HMRC concluded that the operation of their salary sacrifice scheme uh, didn't work uh, for, for pension contributions. Uh, it wasn't effective under the salary sacrifice rules. And therefore, um, they wanted information on all of the employees uh, that had been in the uh, under the structure, um, names, addresses, amounts paid, etc. It was, it was uh, in HMRC's view, it was a remuneration uh, that should have been taxed. Um, and they issued a, uh, an information notice for all of that information. It was at that point, somebody had come to us and asked us to deal with it. I said, well, the first thing you have to do is, is HMRC right in law when they concluded that the salary sacrifice um, didn't work? We looked at it and went through it and concluded that it did work and that it did satisfy um, the requirements under law. Uh, and we went back to the officer and challenged their conclusion on that. Um, and on that basis, appealed the Schedule 36 notice as it's uh, not reasonably required because they were wrong in law on the salary for sacrifice. The officer came back and said, we can't appeal, um, which is a, a bold statement, but he came back and said, you, you can't appeal because I'm asking for statutory reference. Well, there is a provision in, in the Schedule 36 that says you can't appeal um, a, against a, a, a request for statutory records. But that is only where paragraph one has been satisfied. So where a notice has been validly issued that asks for statutory records, it's right, you can't appeal against it. But what you can appeal against is a request for statutory records that's been made in a request that isn't lawful, uh, i.e. that doesn't meet requirements of paragraph one. So we went back and said, well, no, you're, you're mistaken because it's not reasonably required. Therefore, the appeal is valid and the statutory records point falls away. Um, and we put him to proof. We, you know, we said, "Why are we wrong? You've got to, you've got to show the onus is on you to show why it is reasonable. Why it, it couldn't possibly be reasonable. Why did we're right on the salary sacrifice?" Um, anyway, they backed down, um, and the inquiry was closed, and the Schedule Thirty Six notice was withdrawn. But you know, it's better to get involved at an early stage. That that turned into a legal argument that didn't need to cost the client. The, possibly as much as it did, had we been able to get involved a bit earlier and close it down. Um, but that's paragraph one, that's hugely important. Don't be afraid of asking an officer why um, he or she thinks the information they've requested is reasonably required. It, again, it's not being obstructive, it's just clarifying the legal framework of their inquiry. Um, and uh, I encourage you to do so. Um, so what's there? what other provisions are um, in Schedule 36? Uh, a notice for a notice to be issued, one of four conditions has to be uh, satisfied. Um, and this is in paragraph 21 of Schedule 36. Uh, a is an obvious one that there's a valid open inquiry. Um, put emphasis on the word open. Um, if there isn't a valid open inquiry, because for example, they didn't open uh, a section 9A inquiry within the inquiry window, which is generally 12 months from when the tax return is filed or 12 months and then next quarter date if it's filed late. Um, but really concentrate on that word open. If they had an open inquiry and closed it, and then issued an information notice after they closed the inquiry, that doesn't need condition A because it's not a valid open inquiry. 
see if the program was closed. So valid point A, uh, condition A is, is an important one. Um, condition B is, um, as regards to the person, the officer has to have a reason to suspect that there is uh, an underassessment of tax or an excessive relief. We'll come back to that one in a minute because that's where all the case law sits. Um, C and D are very rare. You don't often see checking the person's other tax position, for example, their DAT position, condition D, is checking person's deductions, repayments of withholding tax. Um, that, that's really page of matters. But let's concentrate on condition B, which is a reason to suspect. There must be a reason to suspect um, the underassessment of tax or excessive relief claim for an officer to be able to issue a check on 36 notice. And that's on the first, that's almost equivalent, isn't it, to the first hurdle in a discovery assessment. In a discovery assessment, an officer has to show that they have discovered something. So the first hurdle is for HMRC to clear a discovery assessment. And this provision is exactly the same as that, as you would expect, because otherwise the Schedule 36 notice would circumvent the discovery, the discovery uh, provisions. So that's why it's in there. Um, and again, remember the cases for reasonable required, you can't go on a fishing expedition. So challenge the officer in, if it's a paragraph 21 issue to say, well, what reason do you have to suspect? Um, you can't use an information notice to find a reason to suspect. Um, and there was a case on that um, called Kevin Betts and HMRC. It went back to 2013 at the first tier tribunal. And uh, it involved a, a non-resident uh, who emigrated from the UK in March 2008. Um, he was going to sell his home, um, but market conditions were terrible, so he didn't. Instead, he let it out. So it's fine. He was a non-resident landlord. Uh, but he received a dividend from a UK company of over £800,000. Again, that was disregarded income uh, as a non-resident. Um, and HMRC... Um, wanted to have more information about it. Um, so they requested his bank statements, his personal bank statements. Um, and they said they, they want to check the non-residence position um, with these bank statements, bizarrely. Um, and the, the judge in that case said, well, look, you can't use an information notice to find a reason to suspect. Um, at the moment, you haven't got a reason to suspect. So you've asked for this information to try to find a reason to suspect. And you can't do that. You're putting the cart before the horse if you do that. So uh, the judge said, I'm going to strike down the information notice because it doesn't meet uh, condition B, paragraph 21. Uh, and again, you know, challenge an officer um, and say to them, look, what is the reason to suspect? Um, you know, and if it's a weak reason, I've got a gut feeling, well, this might happen, that probably doesn't meet condition B. And it's okay to challenge an officer. Um, and if they don't like it, that's, you know, that's their lookout. You know, all we're doing is saying, well, I just want to clarify the legal framework of this inquiry. Um, I, perfectly reasonable to do that. Um, and, you know, and if the office doesn't like it, well, I'm, I'm afraid that's their, their lookout. Um, I put in there paragraph 18 as well, power of possession. What's on that slide is the entirety of paragraph 18. Um, it's you know, an information notice only requires a person to produce a document if it is in the person's uh, possession or power. Um, so uh, HMRC's uh, compliance handbook says, well, what they understand by that is having physical control over documents. Um, it doesn't mean legal um, legal possession of the document. It, it can mean having physical control. So even if you haven't got uh, legal ownership of a document, can you get it? Uh, and there was a case uh, called One Paul Insurance Services Limited, um, the 2022 case where HMRC had issued an information notice um, requesting information and documents uh, to a company um, where the company had used a remuneration trust. It was set up by the company and funded by the company. And the, the appellant, the, the, the company director said, well, look, the trustees have that information uh, and we cannot get it. It's, you know, it's not in our possession. Uh, we don't have it, you'll have to ask the trustees. And that would, of course, mean a third-party notice, um, third-party information notice. And the, the judge in that case um, accepted that the, the company didn't have any legal power um, under the trustee 
to compel the trustees to provide the documents requested by HMRC. So that was a given. They said, but we know you haven't got legal title. So we know you, you can't legally um, compel the trustees to give you that information. However, because you contrib uh, contributed significant sums to the remuneration trust, we believe that you have significant influence over the trustees to be able to get them to do it. So it wasn't in their possession, um, but it was in their power to get it. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean legal power. It includes situations where you could get the information because of who you are. So the, the appellant lost that case and the, the information notice was held to be valid. So power or possession, it's power is 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 the sort of the real um the real bit in that paragraph that that sort of goes beyond legal ownership. So possession is one thing, but do you have the power to get it? Um, and every answer that every officer comes up against will probably be no, we haven't got the power to do it, but you have to look behind that and say, well, what's the reality? Is the reality is, as in this case, you're a significant contributor to this trust. Um, do you hold sway over the trustees? The answer to that is probably, probably going to be uh, yes. Um, so they are the three important, very important paragraphs. There are many important paragraphs in um, Schedule 36, but they are the three main ones. Is it reasonably required? Is there a reason to suspect, uh, suspect? And is it in the power of possession of the person that you are asking the information or documents from? Um, very important things, sub subject to a lot of case law um, and quite technical on, on some areas. Um, you know, seek specialist advice if, if in doubt, just ask them. Um, but safeguards, um, because it's such an intrusion, uh, Schedule 36 information notice, there has to be safeguards. Um, and there are safeguards in uh, the, the Schedule 36. The first one is paragraph, not the first one, but one of them is uh, paragraph 20. Um, and that generally says you cannot ask for a document uh, where the whole of the document originates from six years before the date of the notice. Um, if they do, they can ask uh, an authorised officer um, to go back further than that. Um, but generally, any request for documents that originated wholly before six years of the date of the notice should be looked at um, closely um, and to decide whether it fits the requirements of paragraph 20. Um, paragraph 29 does allow uh, an appeal process. Um, you can appeal against the uh, Schedule 36 notice, of course. Paragraph 32 deals with how that is done generally in writing within 30 days to the officer that's issued the uh, notice in the first place. I should say as well, we've concentrated on information and documents. Um, there are inspection powers within Schedule 36 as well. So paragraph 10, for example, will say HMRC have the power to inspect business premises, business assets, or business documents that are on the premises where it is reasonably required to check the tax position, taxpayer. I think it's important to recognise that that power of the paragraph 10 is not an entry warrant. It's not a power to break in and enter premises. You would need a court permission to do that. You would need, you would need a warrant um, that's issued by a court to do that. So it's not an entry warrant, paragraph 10. So you might, what happens if I don't comply? Well, if you don't comply, there are penalties. Um, and the penalties are, um, there's an initial penalty on the paragraph 39, 300 pounds for a failure to comply or where you're obstructing the HRC. Um, it's a nasty little paragraph, in, uh, paragraph 40A, um, where it says, if you do provide information and documents that are inaccurate, you can be charged 3,000 pounds for each inaccuracy. So if you've got 10 inaccuracies in a document, that's a 30,000 pound um, penalty. Uh, so in a way, it's better not to give it um, than to give inaccurate uh, information. So there are some significant penalties. Uh, you've got a right to appeal against a penalty uh, in writing um, under paragraph 47. It has to be in writing um, within 30 days, and that's to HMRC. It doesn't say to the officer, and that's under paragraph 48. But, but look at this one, uh, paragraph 50. There are tax geared penalties for continued non-compliance with a, an information notice. When you feel, well, okay, who issues those tax penalties? Uh, and it's the upper, upper tier tribunal. So these are senior judges at the upper tier tribunal. And the upper tier 
tribunal is the equivalent of a high court. It's on that sort of level. So these are very senior judges. And very often judges of the high court will sit in the upper tier tag tribunal. So when you see a decision where it lists the judges as Mr. or Mrs. Justice X and upper tier tribunal X, that's a high court judge that's sitting in that jurisdiction for the, uh, the upper tier tribunal. So these are very senior judges that deal with this element. Um, and because they're very senior judges, they are bold in, in taking actions. Now, I've, I've put there a case of uh, Sukhdev Matu. Uh, it was a 2021 case uh, that was a, an upper tier tribunal case, as it had to be, where HMRC asked the upper tier tribunal to issue a, a tax geared penalty against uh, Sukhdev Matu. And the penalty in the end was £350,000. That's a huge penalty. Um, £350,000 the upper tier tribunal ordered um, uh, Sukhdev Matu to, to pay uh, for his continued non compliance with the new information purchase. So it is very important to comply with a validly issued Schedule 36 notice. But equally, it is also valid to challenge uh, an information notice where you think it doesn't fit the legal frame. And that might be because the information is not reasonably required, it's not in the power or possession of the person, or it's not, uh, there isn't a reason to suspect. So look at an information notice closely. They are um, very important uh, notices. They have to be dealt with properly. Um, and the consequence of not dealing with them properly probably is um, potentially a £350,000 penalty uh, against you or your client. Um, again, if in doubt, do, do take advice because there is a lot at stake with the Schedule 36 notice. They are a complex piece of legislation, it can be. That's why they're subject to much litigation in the tribunal. So, you know, ask. If, if in any doubt, do ask. Don't put yourself in a position where you're sort of struggling. Um, we can help. Um, tax specialists can help. So there are a number of us out there who do, do, seek, do seek help. I'm uh, just conscious of the time, so let's uh, move on to uh, deliberate behaviour. Um, and I wanted to talk about deliberate behaviour because very often um, you'll see an officer allege deliberate behaviour. And um, there are so many consequences to that um, that I think it's worth talking about. Um, so it's for HMRC to deliberate behaviour. It's not for the taxpayer to disprove a negative. We don't have to prove that we weren't acting deliberately. It is for HMRC to prove uh, that that you or the client, taxpayer, was acting deliberately. So what, what does that mean? The case of um, Auxilium Project Management Limited there on the slide is a 2016 case. And the judge in that case said, well, look, look, a deliberate inaccuracy occurs when a taxpayer knowingly provides HMRC with a document that contains an error with the intention that HMRC should rely upon it as an accurate document. This is a subjective test. Now, I've, I've put emphasis on that. So this is a subjective test, and we'll come to that. The question is not whether a reasonable taxpayer might have made the same error, or even whether this taxpayer failed to take all reasonable steps to ensure that the return was accurate. It is a question of the knowledge and intention of the particular taxpayer at the time. Again, I've put emphasis on that so, so what does that mean it's what an officer very i've heard an officer use phrases like well they must have known they should have known um they couldn't have not known um well none of that meets the test for proving deliberate behavior there has to be uh evidence produced by hmrc to say that you your client the taxpayer specifically them specifically they specifically acted deliberately um, they had full knowledge of what they were doing, and they intended at the time to throw HMRC off the scent or uh, get HMRC to rely on the document they knowing they knew was incorrect. That's that's a big, big task, uh, and, and as I said, that's not for us to prove or disprove. That is for HMRC to prove. Uh, and, and because it's a subjective test, you have to look at the individual. A sophisticated individual. Um, might it might be easier to prove that they knew what they were doing um, if they were financially sophisticated. Um, 
you might recall a case of a, a barrister um, being prosecuted for um, VAT dishonesty um, a few years ago. It was Rowan Prashad Kingston. Um, he stood trial at Blackfriars Crown Court. Uh, and I was a witness in that trial, and I, I gave evidence um, on behalf of the prosecution. Um, and his defence was that he thought his clerks were dealing with the VAT. Um, he wasn't really sophisticated. But this is a gentleman who ran a practice. Um, he was a QC, uh, and his practice was professional negligence. Um, and he was sophisticated. He had a sophisticated knowledge of figures. Um, he, he was an incredibly intelligent man. Um, and HMRC was saying he was acting dishonestly. Um, and it was easier for them to prove before a jury at Blackfriars Crown Court at that point because they said, look, look at him. He's an intelligent guy. He's a QC. He understands figures. Whereas if that was someone um, less, in, less financially uh, savvy, um, Harry Redknapp, do you remember his trial? You know, um, it, he, he wasn't aware that he had an offshore bank account in his dog's name. Um, he didn't understand figures, and the jury believed him. So you, you've got to look at the person. Where someone's intelligent and uh, has a sophisticated uh, knowledge of finance, it's easier for HMRC to prove deliberate behaviour. Um, but that's more difficult where that financial savviness or knowledge isn't prevalent. Um, but even HMRC uh, accepts that, you know, while the, the, the burden of proof is on the civil standard, so is it more likely than not that they acted deliberately, um, they accept that they have to have a better quality of evidence depending on the person. But better quality of evidence than, say, for proving carelessness behaviour, but even better quality evidence where um, the individual is not tax or financially um, aware, uh, as a, a different client uh, who might be more aware of financially and fiscally. So their compliance handbook says, whilst the standard of proof is the same, whether the inaccuracy is careless or deliberate, the quality of the evidence should be higher for the more serious behaviour. So they accept that you know, uh, deliberate behaviour is a, a serious thing. And, and we'll come on in a moment to what, what that means uh, for a finding of deliberate behaviour. Um, but again, do put the officer to proof. It's for them to prove. Um, we, we've got a, a number of cases. Um, well, let, let me tell you about a case we had not so long ago. Um, a solicitor was dealing with the case and it came to me um, right at the very end of the process where um, HMRC had issued personal liability notices to two officers of the company for a VAT deliberate error. Um, of course, before you can get to a personal liability notice, um, deliberate behaviour has to be found, and it was in the company, and then the personal liability notices uh, for VAT of over £300,000 were issued against these two officers of the company. And they came to us at that point, and I think we only had a few days left before the appeal window to the tribunal closed. So we took them on, uh, we uh, notified the appeal to the uh, first tier tax tribunal. Um, we then uh, applied for a stay um, pending uh, an ADR uh, application, so we went into mediation. And this officer, uh, this VAT officer, all the way through had, in effect, put his fingers in his ears and, and gone la 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 and not listened to the clients or their, or their advocate, their solicitor, that was acting for them. Um, and we managed to get him into to mediation. And let me tell you, in, within less than an hour, uh, the, uh, the personal liability notices have been withdrawn. Um, there was no finding of deliberate behaviour against our officers because we put him to proof. We put him in a room with our clients and said, you know, what is it about the information you received? And we've got it here in front of us that led you to conclude that our clients had acted dishonestly um, to enable you to, to issue a personal liability notice against them, each of them. Um, and, and you couldn't answer um, and when you kept pressing them, and the thing about mediation is what you're doing is A, trying to, primarily trying to come to a settlement, but B, what you're doing also is assessing the quality <clears throat> of witnesses in a potential tribunal case. So if, if the ADR failed and it went to tribunal, what you're doing is actually looking at the quality of, of what that witness will be like on in the tribunal when, when they're being cross-examined on their, their witness state. So... Um, it helped that we thought he would be a very weak witness um, and that he would be a very weak witness because he didn't 
really know why he came to the conclusion about deliberate behaviour. But it got right through the process, right to the end, um, right to the tribunal stage before he backed down. And let me tell you, he backed down incredibly quickly in, in mediation. So it is okay to hold an officer to account uh, and say, well, what is it that leads you to a conclusion of deliberate? And as I say, if they say things like, well, it must have been, that, that cannot be right. Um, you know, uh, the Christopher Lund cases that some of you may remember, I acted for some of the uh, clients of Christopher Lund um, in, in, in those cases, where HMRC had said, well, because he had acted deliberately, the client must have acted deliberately as well. And there is a provision that says, um, it's the taxpayer acts deliberately or someone on their behalf. What HMRC didn't do was put the last piece of the puzzle in and said, well, it, it's someone acting on the taxpayer's behalf where the taxpayer had, had knowledge of them acting deliberately. If they didn't, then you can't pin that on, on the taxpayer. And we defeated a lot of uh, HMRC cases where they were going for deliberate penalties in that, that Christopher Lund days. Um, uh, and why is it like that? Well, it's because there's a human rights element to it. Um, Article 6 says, look, you know, we have the right not to cooperate with you um, because it comes from the right not to self incriminate So it's okay to say to an officer, um, you, you need to prove everything. I'm not going to help you because um, I've, I've got a right not to self incriminate. So I'm not going to I'm not going to help you at all. Um, and even the compliance handbook says that you know an officer cannot request self incriminating testimony evidence, um, and that that's a fundamental principle of human rights law. Um, they go on in their compliance handbook to say, look, we, being HMRC, need to balance the view that uh, non-cooperation may be an attempt to stop us identifying the underlying behaviour. And that's an interesting way of putting it. It may stop us identifying it, i.e. they know they have to prove it, but they want to get you, your client or the taxpayer, to do it for them. So it's an interesting choice of language, but it probably says a lot about how some officers uh, allege deliberate behaviour a little bit too easily. Um, and we have to assess that against the requirement imposed by tribunals and courts. So a requirement imposed by tribunals and courts for us to provide a higher quality of evidence when we are alleging dishonesty. Um, and that has to be right. So uh, why is it important to challenge a finding of dishonesty? Um, look, and just before we come on to that, let me say, look, if your client, if you're an advisor on this webinar, the client comes to you and says, I've done something deliberately, um, then you've got some professional ethics where you have to deal with that. Um, and it may be that you approach HMRC uh, and because there's an admission of deliberate behaviour, you certainly have to think about code of practice tonight. Um, so look, it, it doesn't mean if your client, if you're an advisor, your client comes to you and says, I've done something deliberately. It doesn't mean you say, well, you know, it's not for us. They have to prove it. Uh, I think professionally, you, I know professionally you would have to deal with something like that. And that would probably involve approaching HMRC uh, with a view to going into code of practice. But so let's go back. So why is it important to um, challenge a finding of de deliberate behaviour? Well, of course, there's higher penalties. Um, uh, any potential lost revenue is the, uh, the basis for any penalty calculation. Um, and the penalty is a percentage of that potential lost revenue. Um, so there are higher penalties for deliberate behaviour, as you'd expect. So that, that's the initial consequence, is that it uh, it cost you more. Um, but what else? It's, it also extends the assessment time limits, doesn't it? When we went back to that, that, that uh, slide right at the beginning, um, a finding of deliberate behaviour allows HMRC to go back 20 years. Now, that's a huge leap from careless, which is six years, to 20 years. So that additional 14 years may be an awful lot more tax, certainly a lot more interest, um, and a lot more potential lost revenue for penalties to be applied. So. They are two incredibly serious consequences of uh, agreeing a finding of deliberate behaviour. What else? Well, there's the closer supervision by HMRC. Um, and, you know, they, they might very well put you into managing serious defaulters regime. They can actually name, subject to certain parameters, and depending on the level of tax, name and shame you, um, you your client or taxpayer. Um, but the managing serious defaulters regime um, means that HMRC will take a close interest uh, in you um, for probably five years or so. Um, the managing serious defaulters regime is extended from uh, the managing deliberate defaulters regime. The managing deliberate defaulters regime came about in about February 2011, I think. Uh, and that said, well, look, you know, where you haven't, where you've defaulted on your, your tax filing requirements, um, 
we're gonna we're gonna deliberately we're gonna or you haven't told us about something we're gonna put you into the managing deliberate default regime and to you know, watch you closely for the next few years. Well, in April 2013, David Gould, the then Exchequer Secretary for the Treasury, extended that and said, well, actually, look, where people deliberately don't pay their tax on time as well, um, we're going to put them into a, a new scheme called Managing Serious Defaulters Regime. So MSD was really uh, a, a widening of MDD uh, to encompass those that deliberately don't pay their tax on time. So you, you can take uh, closer supervision of those people. Um, uh, and look, you don't want to be in that. You have HMRC year on year picking through in minute detail all of your tax affairs. Um, I, I doubt your clients want that or you if you're a, a taxpayer. Um, beyond that, there's a personal reputational privilege. Um, you know, if, if you're found to deliberately evaded tax, um, you've got your personal reputation um, will suffer. Um, if you're a professional, um, you know, you're any professional, um, you, you'd lose uh, you know, your professional status or your professional standing. Um, you know, and that means a lot to some people. Some people run their practice on their professional reputations. Um, but more than that, um, if you're if you're regulated, um, a professional that's regulated, you know, if you're an accountant regulated by the ICAEW or the Solicitor by Solicitor's Regulation Authority or a doctor um, by the uh, General Medical Council, um, those regulatory bodies are almost certainly going to take action against any one of their members. Well, certainly in, in sort of law and accountancy, um, they're going to take action against their members that have been found to have deliberately evaded tax. That could mean suspension, more likely expulsion, uh, and a public finding of misconduct. Um, there will be regulatory fines to pay uh, as well. So, look, there are serious consequences to admitting deliberate behaviour. And, and, you know, it's okay to challenge an officer on a finding of did behaviour, and it is okay to put them to proof, and it's okay to establish the legal framework, um, at, you know, and, and say to them, what would you say at a tribunal uh, if this went, what would you say to a judge that led you to conclude deliberate behaviour? And the reason it's okay to do that um, is because the consequences of a finding of deliberate behaviour are hugely significant. Again, you know, ask for help. Don't don't sit there worrying yourself. I'll talk to a specialist. It's, it's it's okay. You know, I'm I don't get involved with audits because I'm not an auditor. So I, you know, if I am a tax investigation specialist, so if you want help, there are people out there to help, and I'm more than happy to help. Um, as Tim said earlier, that because of the number of people on this webinar today, it's not uh, appropriate to take questions and answers. But I will give you my email address at the end of this. Uh, you know, ask. Don't don't if you want to run something by tax investigation specialist, just ask. Um, and be careful, don't make the wrong decision because you'll probably get sued um, if, you, if you do. Um, you know, with disclosures and things like that, don't, if someone's done something deliberately and you go into anything other than a cop nine, um, you could well be sued. So look, talk to a specialist, be careful, do ask, we're, we're here. Um, uh, and we're very, very happy to help. Um, there's some upcoming webinars that I know Tim's going to talk about uh, in, in a moment, so I won't uh, labour them. But look, thank you very much for your time today. It's been my pleasure to go through this. We've, we've sort of, it's in an hour, you can only sort of touch the surface. Um, but there's my email address. It's dion.lakelbrevator.com. Do feel free to get in touch. I'm very happy to help you or my, my team are as well. So get in contact with me in the first place. Happy to help on, on any of your tax investigation matters. Um, but for the moment, I'll uh, hand you back to Tim. Thank you very much, Dion, and thanks for such an interesting and informative talk. Um, as Dion said, if you've got any questions for him, email him and he'll be delighted to help you. Can I just add a couple of things to what Dion said um, to agree in one particular area that he raised? And the area that I've had quite a bit of experience in that I fully agree with Dion uh, regarding is alternative dispute resolution. And I'm sure Dion would agree with this. Um, in the past, I've attended meetings with the Revenue on alternative dispute resolution, and it's been incredibly successful. I remember doing a lecture in Birmingham, oh, I don't know, many, many years ago. And the lady came up to me and she said, I attended your previous lecture. You recommended ADR. We've done it. And we've saved the client, I think it was 60,000 pounds. It was VAT. 
So ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, is just one of the things that uh, Dion mentioned I'm a huge fan of. And we at Gravita could help you. We could attend that for you. A couple of things that I've learned from ADR. Number one, you can have the meeting at the accountant's office, not the mediator, not the revenue. So that would be more comfortable for the client. And secondly, with ADR and the ones that I've done, um, we've asked the mediator, can our VAT guy um, be uh, present as well? Can our pay-as-you-earn guy, our team? And the mediator, slightly reluctant in one of them, uh, eventually agreed. And obviously, you feel much more comfortable when you've got loads of your team around to deal with any areas. So uh, ADR, I'm a huge fan of because it's quick. Um, going to the tribunal takes a long time. And ADR, I think, is a very useful tool. And if I can just add a couple of things to what Dion said, um, if you don't mind, only for a couple of minutes. In my experience, I think investigations are increasing, really much so. And for example, in the last year, I've seen HMRC attack property transactions. And Dion, you're very free to come in on any of this, but I've seen HMRC attack property transactions more than ever. And I think one of the big things that I've seen and um, people come up to me at my lectures and, and talk about it is, are you trading in property? This seems a really increased revenue attack. They all started with a case called Mrs. Hashmi a few years ago now where the revenue denied her capital gains tax principal private residence relief. But the judge actually said, well, yeah, fine. But I think she was trading in property. And that really embarrassed the revenue. The case that you might want to have a look at there is Mrs. Hashmi. And ever since that case of a few years ago, I've noticed that the revenue have become much more aggressive, particularly with builders who buy houses, move their family in, do them up, sell them, claim PPR um, and do it time and time again. And the revenue now are getting quite aggressive um, and saying they're trading in property. Just very, very quickly, a couple of other things as well. Um, Dion mentioned salary sacrifice. I think the key thing with that, and the revenue do inquire about it, is if you do a salary sacrifice, you've got to change the employment contract of the employee. And lots of people fail to do that. I've seen investigations recently on company credit cards, where the private use of company credit cards, uh, the revenue take a great attraction and look at that. And there's been a case on that as well. Um, and Dion said at the start, um, status, particularly in the construction industry. You know, if you've got a contractor engaging the same sub is month after month, there must be a big question. Are they genuinely self-employed? Now, Dion and his team can help you with all of those things and a lot more. And also the serious stuff, COP 9s, COP 8s. Um, you know, you can't address those things unless you've really got professional help with a specialist. And use Dion's team. If you've got any queries from this, uh, from this morning's webinar, contact us and we'd be delighted to help you. And finally, and also, can you fill in your feedback forms as well? I'd be very grateful if you could do that. And finally, can I just remind you of three things that are coming up, three events um, that I think are really good. The first one, on Tuesday, the 6th of February, I'm gonna be presenting Business Tax Refresher Part Two. It doesn't matter if you didn't attend part one, it's really quite a standalone uh, lecture. Uh, webinar presentation. But if you go to Gravita's website, it gives you details of everything we're going to cover in these three uh, webinars, and you can get more information there. But I thoroughly recommend all of them. So that's the first one. Lots of interesting business topics and planning that I'm going to cover in that uh, webinar, all for one hour, nine till 10. And then we've got R&D on the 15th of February. I hope you're in a state to watch that after Valentine's Day the night before. Um, we've got cap allowances. That's another one that I'm doing. And in particular, I think that's a very interesting and useful uh, webinar. We're going to be doing a lot of planning on that. And we're going to include claims that we've done, that the revenue queried, that we've been successful on, for example, landscaping. Awful lot. I would, in particular, um, well, all three really, R&D is very important, and the cap allowances. And if there are any budget changes on the 6th of March, we're going to cover those as well. Um, look at Gravita's website for um, our um, productions and everything about the, um, the budget. Right, okay, we're almost there. So thank you very much for watching. 
And can I say one final thing? We're here to help you. We've got a fantastic team, um, particularly on investigations. You know, it's a very specialised area and contact Dion and team and we'd be delighted to help you. And in other, any other area, really, on tax consultancy. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for the Gravita people behind the scenes for their technical assistance. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Bye-bye.